Hello, everybody. This is Matt Williamson from Pop Goes the 60s, and today we're doing a spotlight on Revolution 9 with my special guest, Anthony Rotuno. Welcome back, Anthony. Hello. Yeah, it's been a while. What was the last one we did? You Never Give Me Your Money, I think, wasn't it? Uh, I was, yeah. The, uh, Must the be Doggett a year book. and a bit. Yeah, mm. the Peter Doggett book. And today we're going to delve into a track that's probably the most, what would you call this song? I mean, it's not a song, I guess. It's a track, but it's probably the most controversial Beatle track probably out there and we'll go into why that is yeah I definitely wouldn't call it a song but I want to make that point just that you can't compare it to you know I want to hold your hand or something right it's definitely. a sound collage or a sound picture as George Martin called it so and I think it's yeah. because of that very reason that people skip it and they do not listen to this mm. track but we'll talk about that a little bit but first let me introduce you to some of the people who may not know you from my past shows that you and I've done together Anthony has his own podcast called Glass Onion on John Lennon, and he does, oh, you've done how many shows now? 99. 99, okay. Yeah, hanging on, well, making the audience wait for number 100, because I'm waiting <laughs> for one of my guests to be available, so. Okay. Yeah, 99 plus bonuses, so probably about 110 shows I've actually put out. But, well, the reason yeah. I chose Anthony for this discussion and the spotlight series is because he's already done quite a lot of work on the topic of Revolution 9, not only in this podcast, but he's only he's also done some writing on the, the topic as well. Yeah, it was episode 25. It was the end of 2019. It's the end of the, the first year of the podcast. And I feel like it was a breakthrough episode because up to that point, I'd done some nice episodes, but uh, I recorded that around Christmas I had a couple of drinks, you know, nothing, nothing too uh, outrageous, but just a couple of drinks. And I kind of, it was the first time I'd really personalized on the show because I'm, I'm really obsessed with this piece. Again, I'm not going to call it a song, but we'll call it a piece. And I can explain why if you want later on that it is to do with the, the way I heard it and a certain couple of sets of circumstances in which I heard it. But I really love this. I think this is a major piece of work. And I'm glad that you kind of agree with me uh, to to some extent, I think. Yeah, so, I certainly agree with you. So I, I would go so far to say that it heightens the Beatles' overall catalog. And then when we're talking about the White Album, it, it takes the White Album to another stratosphere of, of a masterpiece because of its inclusion. And it's very much misunderstood, and I completely understand why. It's certainly not for everybody. But I thought it'd be a good idea to give a different perspective on some of the nuances of it that makes it so special and that it is really quite, I mean, this is well thought out, very mm. well thought out. Yeah. It's a nice mixture of random and thought out because I'm sure John Lennon didn't look for all these pieces. I mean, I guess we've got stuff to say about who actually compiled them and everything, but I don't think he, he looked for specific ones, but it's, I think he just cobbled together lots and lots of diverse sounds and, Obviously, they did the voices, but sounds and sound effects. And then he he crafted it together. And um, in a minute, uh, when we talk about our origins, I will explain that because I've got to give a big shout out to a guy whose website I first um, read in the late 90s, I think. And he really helped me make sense of that. And that was the first time I realized that this was well thought out. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice mixture of random and uh, structured. So, yeah. Well, for those people who are not that familiar or who have been able to avoid it this 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 long, I'm just going to give you a brief description here that comes from William Eckert, who wrote a book called The Psychedelic Popular Music, A History Throughout Musical Topic Theory. And he said Revolution 9 is a sound collage, which has been described as a piece of experimental, avant-garde, music concrete, surrealist, and psychedelic music. So that's about as short of a description, I think, as you'll find, but that covers the basis. Yeah, so avant-garde is to do with, um, avant-garde literally is, is related to the word vanguard, which is to do with advancing, which even actually comes from the army, from the military. So it's to do with, um, it's the, the, front, the front line in the sense of the one that's advancing first. And it's also used in terms of uh, movements, you know, as in genres. And then, yeah, you could say sound collage, uh, music concrete, as you said, which... I, I just find this piece much more interesting than a lot of the ones that inspired it, which again, I guess we'll come to later, but it's, uh, yeah, as, as I said uh, just a minute ago, George Martin called it a sound picture. 
and he he talked about how you could sit in front of the speakers either with headphones or just with a big pair of speakers and you could picture what's going on and you could picture the confusion and it's the confusion inside john lennon's head if you remember you were on glass onion we did a really nice couple of shows on 1968 mm -hmm. and we talked about how john lennon's nervous system just took an absolute hammering that year partly self-inflicted partly to do with what was going on so i think it's it's about what's going on inside his head but then it's also vietnam and you know the, the whole uh correct chaos that was coming uh, in america because when you're on my show as well we talked about something that i've never heard anyone talk about which is the fact that martin luther king was assassinated while the beatles were in india and we never heard anyone nobody asked them what they thought about that because they would have heard about that when they came back from india which would have been pretty crazy you know they're, yeah. they're in this world of meditation and peace they come back to get that news and then obviously robert kennedy died so i think it's a sort of it's a picture of uh, John Lennon's internal world and then the external world of 68 as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what is your first memory of hearing the song? I just want to get your history and then I'll give you mine. Sure. Okay. Well, I mean, when I very first heard it, in my um, in this magical sort of two-year period when I had the Beatles full immersion, which was in the late 80s, which was nice because in one sense you had to work a little bit because I had to go to the library and get the cassettes. But... In the other, on the other hand, I didn't have to wait. You know, it wasn't like in the 60s when you had to wait for them to come with a, a new uh, album. It was one of the last Beatles albums I heard. And I was, the White Album in general, it did kind of throw me a little bit. And because I was more steeped in the, in the more catchy, you know, easier to listen to stuff, you could say more accessible. Revolution 9, I didn't really have a strong opinion on it. I thought it was a bit strange. I didn't listen to it a lot, but I do remember playing it to some people at school and their their reaction was actually anger, which is quite an interesting reaction. You get that sometimes when you challenge people uh, too much or, you know, something that doesn't seem to make any sense. Often people will get angry. But the person I wanted to shout out was a fellow called Ian Hammond, and he had a website back in the old, the old internet days called Beethoven. But he's obviously done the same thing as the Beatles and made a little pun. So B-E-A-T-H-O-V-E-N. And he actually listens to Glass Onion because I mentioned him when I did my episode on Revolution 9 and he got in touch, which was great. Yeah, he had a website and um, he, he showed me that, as we said earlier, the structure was there. Uh, for example, pointing out that the piano, which um, he also pointed out was in B minor, which made me think of, kind of sadness or melancholy mm -hmm. the piano and the number nine which i'm sure a lot of people always thought was george martin because it sounds like it should be george martin doing that test engineer voice he said that they come in roughly every minute so roughly every minute of this piece has got a flavor and the other thing i noticed through him was that you'll see about about five minutes in everything ratchets up and it gets very intense and then it all comes down again. So I, I started to think of it in a more symphonic way. You know, you're bringing them up and then taking them down again. Mm -hmm. So that was really my history. And then over the years, I've just become obsessed with it. And I should mention, you know, just to, to be candid, I did used to enjoy it with herbal uh, jazz cigarettes, as they're called. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would, I remember sitting in the, lying in the garden with headphones on under the influence and just, just suddenly something clicked and i think the left right panning is very interesting if you listen on headphones you'll hear that the sounds drifting and um from then i've become i don't know probably quite obsessed with it because i'm quite obsessed with john lennon's speaking voice as well as his singing voice mm -hmm. and when i think about it i can hear trauma in his voice there's i wrote down a load i don't have it here but i wrote down a load of um um, sound, ways to categorize sound. So he's, he's sort of growling, whimpering. You know, he sounds he sounds almost like a baby at one point. And uh, I got this image of Yoko cradling him in a kind of mother type way. Mm -hmm. And um, the the vocalisms are absolutely astonishing. When he's sort of going right, right, I can't do it with my voice, but <laughs> he makes these incredible sounds. So, um, yeah, in short, I'm quite obsessed with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's it. <laughs>
Well, my my experience, I first heard it at the age of like nine or ten. So this is when uh, mm. I was with my friend Dan. His he all of a sudden got several albums given to him by his older sister, and the second batch was um, Revolver and the White Album. So we took to that the White Album just like the others, and. I did realize there was something different about the album as a whole. It just sounded more mature and more, there was a more darkness to it. But when we got to side four, we typically would get through about a minute and a half, two minutes of Revolution 9, and then hit the eject button. So we would occasionally listen to it all the way through just because we're doing whatever in the basement. And it didn't seem to bother us. We didn't, I know people do, do get angry about this, so they don't like to be challenged in that way. And it is a challenging piece. But for maybe we're just preoccupied. But typically, I, I that's why I know the first ninety seconds much better than the last, you know, uh, six and a half minutes. Six minutes, yeah. And um, so anyway, I it wasn't until many years later I was in my mid twenties and I was taking a nap on a Saturday afternoon, which I never do. And uh, my roommate had the White Album on the CD player. And I remember Revolution 9 comes on and I was just coming out of a dream or out of my sleep. And I'm listening to this track really for the first time because I was too tired to get up and shut it off and hit the eject uh, button. As nice. it was. So I'm laying there and I'm like, hey, wait a minute here. And it, it spoke to me in a way that I hadn't done before. So it just caught uh, me at the right time. So it was at that point, uh, a good, you know, 12, 15 years later that I began to appreciate it. Now, I still don't listen to it a lot. And the last time I listened to it was uh, just, before, you know, hours ago before we were going to do this because I wanted to take it in fresh. And to my surprise, I was surprised it was over so quick. Now, ah, I, was, nice. I, I was expecting <laughs> it to go on longer. So I was, mm. I was, and I was really listening. I listened more to the instrumentation probably than the vocals so, or to the voices. So we'll talk about, a little about a little bit about the instrumentation coming up here, but that's my background with the song. That's interesting that we both heard it in a kind of haze then really, didn't we? Yeah. Because I, I, you know, I, I get that as well. I mean, I, I, I used to be a pretty bad insomniac and that, so I, I would be often quite sleep deprived and then I'd have a 10 minute nap and it, and it's sometimes it's magical, isn't it? You suddenly feel you, you're in a nice state where your senses are quite heightened, but you're a bit hazy at the same time. And actually, there was another time I have a friend called Ian who was um, he and I met on the first day of school and we just clicked, you know, instantly and started talking about old films at the age of 12. You know, he was the only other person I'd ever met who would watched black and white films ever. And I remember, actually, he, he wasn't really a big fan. And um, I remember I had a car. It wasn't wasn't a great car, but it had a really good stereo system. And. Um, one night we we sort of parked up, um, probably again under the influence of the jazz cigarettes, and um, it was quite dark. And I said to him, "Right, just try and imagine 1968, John Lennon, you know, traumatic time for him, traumatic time for the world." And I cranked it up really loud. And again, like I said, you've got the I think the panning is very important, the stereo setup of it. And uh, I said, "Right, just for eight minutes, just be real quiet." Just let this thing, shut your eyes, let this thing kind of wash over you. And after eight minutes, I said, oh, what do you think? And he said, yeah, I get it. That was it. <laughs> that was his only reaction. Wow. Yeah, I get it. I don't love it, but I get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So I, I think the hazy, it's a bit like, um, I don't know, Apocalypse Now or 2001. Somehow, if you are you are under the influence or you're a bit tired or something, I don't know, It's, it's because your senses are a bit sharper. And maybe you let your guard down, you know, when you're a bit tired or you've just come out of a nap. So maybe it's it's not having that resistance to it. You know, if people don't want to listen to it, of course, it's fine. They don't have to. But I just think if, if you are at all into that kind of experimental stuff, the same way that, you know, I like experimental films as well, then I think there's a lot there. That's why one of the reviews was very ironic saying, this has got no re-listen value. Because the whole point is that you can't get it on one listen. So, yeah, um, I would say it took me years and uh, yeah, few very few listens, but it just took time. But we will Ooh. get to that for sure. So let's let's jump over to the inspirations to this track because mm. this idea of avant-garde music or music concrete, these are were not new, uh, but they were new to pop music. I would say by and large, 
And there were some things, the pieces that came before that probably inspired John Lennon, perhaps via Yoko Ono and uh, Paul McCartney. And because everybody was starting to dabble in this type of stuff, the the vanguard, as you as you put it earlier. Yeah, I mean, music concrete. I've got a couple of, uh, I think I have anyway. I've got a couple of uh, definitions. So music concrete. Now, it might seem strange that it's called concrete, which means concrete, mm -hmm. because the whole point is that it's very abstract. But what it is, it's using concrete sounds. So the idea of um, in Revolution 9, you've got bells, you've got, I don't know, whatever it is, just mundane voices and then car horns and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, so there's a couple of uh, definitions, a type of music composition that utilizes recording sounds, recorded sounds as raw material, or a recorded montage of natural sounds, often electronically modified and presented as a musical composition. So I'll just chuck out a few names. So you've got Schaefer's Symp Symphony for a Man Alone. And I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just point out the similarities for each one. It's very brief. Mm -hmm. So you've got human sounds like um, in this piece, there's a laugh that's looped. So obviously there's laughing in uh, Revolution 9 as well as crying. James Tenney's collage number one, and note that he's, he's calling it number one, which may have influenced number nine. Mm -hmm. And that, I think you haven't heard that, have you? But I'd, I'd urge no, you no. And, the listen, and the viewers to listen to that. It takes uh, Elvis Presley's Blue Suede Shoes and mixes it with, uh, you know, music concrete, you know, these just random sounds. And I, I've only heard it once, but I'm, I'm not sure whether Blue Sway Shoes is actually backwards or it's somehow distorted. But I think it's the idea of taking something very mainstream and recognisable and mixing it with avant-garde. You've got uh, Gesang de Jungling by Stockhausen. And note that Stockhausen was on the Sgt Pepper cover. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been courtesy of Paul McCartney. Uh, Williams Mix by John Cage. Frank Zappa's Return of the Son of Monster Magnet, which... It's similar in the sense that it's got a beat. And although Revolution 9 doesn't actually have a beat, um, I came up with an idea the other day of listening to the isolated drums of Revolution 1, the slow version, with Revolution 9. And it's weird to hear it with a beat, because that's obviously where it came from. It came from take 18 of Revolution 1. Um, and then probably the closest one is a uh, Rose Art Mix by John Cage which again, it includes, um, um, there's a baby, baby sounds, which you hear in Revolution 9. And that one is probably the most similar. But mm -hmm. what I found really was that none of those were any way as interesting as Revolution 9. I think Revolution 9 is way more interesting. And again, it's partly because I have this very strong association with John Lennon that goes back to being, you know, 13 years old. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm connected in that way. But yeah, there's a few pieces and then a piece that was influenced by Revolution 9 is a, a, a track called War Games by The Loving Spoonful. Again, that'd be worth listening to, mm -hmm. um, which is similarities. So, yeah, it's got a bit of music concrete and um, avant-garde in a very general sense, yeah. Did you yes. mention Stockhausen's hymn then? Oh, no, I didn't actually, no. That's got a, that's a, actually got a radio scan, isn't it, which influenced yeah. I Am The Walrus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very true. Would so, you say that was the closest one? I would say, yeah. And I think a lot of this experimental is experimentation that became uh, what was called avant-garde came out of the classical. Uh, yes. And that, because classical was really advancing in the first half of the 20th century, getting into very strange territory. And I think that's where the Cage, John Cage came from that. That was his background initially, I believe. Yeah. But you can see that all these these different things that were going on at the time influenced Lennon. In fact, the one that was called Number One. I'll have to look that one up because that is mm -hmm. interesting. And, number one. Yeah. and I was assume that with the influence of Paul McCartney and Yoko Ono over the course of the two years leading up to this, you know, it has a lot. I mean, their fingerprints are all over this. Absolutely, yeah. Can I ask you a question? How mm -hmm. would you, um, listening to these music concrete, how would you, uh, do you find any uh, connection between them? Because I, I find a use of voices and things like laughing sort of put backwards and radio scans. Is that what you think of as music concrete? Is everyday sounds? Is that, 
Yeah, usually everyday sounds, and mm. usually that uh, the composers would modulate it or, or change something to make it seem yeah. you, brand new. Like you were saying, it's reversed, or there's some kind of uh, electronic uh, flourish put on it to make it sound different. Mm. I actually, believe it or not, I actually had a, a part in creating some music concrete in the medical field, mm. if you can believe it. I just happen to think of it now. Uh, there was, it, I worked with, for GE for a while and I was uh, in the marketing end of things and I got brought into a project where one of these big MRI machines, I believe it was an MRI, there's this machine that is incredibly loud. And when you, the body is inside this long tube and they're being, their body's being scanned, mm -hmm. there's this loud sound that is very scary. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to figure out how to make it not scary. So I suggested creating what be, was really a music concrete intro that would essentially alert them that that sound was coming so they would be ready for it. Mm -hmm. So in that wow. case, we, we were using, I was trying not to use music, but using everyday sounds that were somewhat familiar to them that ha and I put it to somewhat of a beat so that they could wow. not be scared by it. And this was actually, this was patented. I don't know that anything ever came from it. I left GE and who knows. So you don't, you're not getting get royalty. You're not getting royalty checks. Not yet. I'm oh, not. Okay. <laughs> but it's not like that's going to be, um, yeah, who knows? I mean, I don't know. That probably never went anywhere. It's just one of the many projects that GE works on that just goes nowhere. But, or like any project, really. Although Revolution 9 didn't go nowhere, it did certainly mm. go somewhere. And mm. um, the beginnings of it, like you had mentioned earlier, it was born out of the fade out of Revolution One, which when I heard that, I'm like, "Wow, that was really I know, surprising." That was such me. a big find, wasn't it? That, yeah. When that appeared online about 15 years ago, whenever it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was incredible. Yeah, and and that's where those these vocalisms that I said that I I can't do myself. With John Lennon, amazing. This is screaming and whimpering and <laughs> all the things he's doing, you know, on this track. But yeah, of course, then, then you hear, uh, then it's Revolution 9 with a beat, you know, with that shuffle beat that comes from Revolution 1. Yeah, it's so interesting. And um, yeah, I, I think of it, when I think of avant-garde, uh, I'm going to quote George Martin again. George Martin said, Paul McCartney is very avant-garde, but apart from private sort of experiments, you know, films that he made you know, in his spare time, he, he mixed it with the commercial. And um, Correct. if yeah. you think of it in terms of film, um, are you familiar with uh, Un Chien Andalou by Bunuel? Or do you, are you aware of Bunuel? Bunuel was a, a Spanish surrealist uh, filmmaker. And he did a short film called uh, Un Chien Andalou, which is, means uh, an Andalusian uh, dog. And um, there's, a, there's a famous scene where a razor cuts somebody's uh, eyeball. Yes, I You've do. probably I seen, seen that. Seen, yeah. Yes, I have yeah, seen that. You've seen that image. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about that, and I, I just re-watched that uh, a few months ago, actually. It was part of a, an English class, funnily enough. And uh, if you, it, it's basically a load of scenes, and all the scenes are recognisable. The human behaviour in it is recognisable, but there's no, the link between them, there's no real narrative. So avant-garde is a bit like taking a lot of noises that we recognise, even could be musical, but then not giving you an easy through line, not giving you a narrative. So you have to work mm -hmm. work on it yourself. Now, if you compare that to something like, are you aware of the Warhol films? You know, one called Sleep, which is literally just a guy sleeping, mm -hmm. or Empire State, which is just a shot at the Empire State building. For me, I almost draw the line. I don't really see too much value in just watching a guy sleeping for five hours, unless... I don't know, you mix it with something really interesting so you get a juxtaposition. I think there's got to be a little kind of hook. And I think Revolution 9, if you compare it to some of these other music concrete, it's actually got more quote-unquote hooks just because, obviously, John was a pop rock musician. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, if you if the more you listen to it, the more you realise that there are things which, you know, not necessarily commercial, but they are things you can hook on to at least. Um, yeah, yeah, like yeah. some of the instrumentation that was used in the track are, are familiar. I mean, we heard Mellotron. It's it's almost like some of the incidental Mellotron we hear in Magical Mystery Tour. Yes. Uh, they actually use some of the back same loops that they used on Tomorrow Never Knows. Yeah. You know, there's some piano. There's 
familiar instrumentation is just very sparse. You know, it's not the main thing. And that's what makes it so on pop. You know, McCartney, for McCartney to release something, it would have had a pop structure to begin with, with probably the music concrete added on top of it rather than the other way around. And that's just one one way that the two minds, Lennon and McCartney, how different they were and how they approached these things. Yeah, I mean, that's a di- yeah, that's exactly the difference. So by 68, I think John Lennon, although uh, he definitely liked the White Album, I mean, because it, the songs, I think his songs are, are just fabulous. You know, there's mm-hmm. five or six songs that were born out of, in, uh, out of India and this massive withdrawal that he was going through. You know, I think they probably, I think when you came on the did the 68 show, we said they probably had a little bit of, uh, Cynthia Lennon wrote, they had a little bit of a uh, hooch, you know, a bit of alcoholic punch and probably a few joints, but he was essentially withdrawing. Mm-hmm. So he was into the, he was still into pop rock music. But I think he was going through a stage where he, he wanted to say, um, if I do something avant-garde, I'm not going to put it in a pop framework. I'm just going to give them it, you know, and hope that they enjoy it as much as I do. Because uh, on that Revolution uh, 1, take 18, you sort of hear John at the end going, oh, it's great, you know, and him and Yoko are laughing about it, how mm-hmm. they're really pleased with themselves, you know. Yeah, he was having uh, a good old time. And I, you know, I think it should be noted that Yoko Ono was brought into the fold and they began a relationship only a f- couple of weeks before they started on this track. I, mm. I think it's about two and a half weeks, maybe three, but relatively it was recent. And I think yeah. that he, part of this is the giddiness over the relationship with her. And I think he was really trying to impress her. I mean, this is, mm. he didn't take to the same. Paul McCartney was offering this kind of stuff two years earlier. He wasn't quite taking to it in the same way. And this shows that uh, how, I, that's why I say he was trying to impress her. I think that's why he got really into it. And the other three members, essentially, at some point, they each were in America during the recording of this. So they removed themselves from it, probably because, you know, they just were the the third wheel. Three third yeah. wheels. Yeah, I mean, obviously... George Harrison's such a strange guy, isn't he? The more the more I the more I read about him, he he's very he's very like John Lennon in that there are just a mass of contradictions, and you're never quite sure whether George Harrison was into something or he wasn't. You know, he, seemed, he seemed to switch a bit back and forth and was a bit reticent about getting too excited about anything other than you know Indian music and you know the Hindu philosophy and things. So he contributed to this, but we don't. Not totally sure. I mean, you you had a quote that you sent me where they were all embarrassed when John played it. Is that right? Including George. Yes. Yeah. Let me just talk about how George helped to compile it. There's a quote that I was very surprised to read where George said this. He said, Ringo and I compiled that. We went into the tape library and looked through the entire room and pulled main selections and gave the tapes to John and he cut them together. The whole thing, number nine, number nine, is because I pulled the box number nine. John sat there and decided which bits to crossfade together. But if Ringo and I hadn't gone there in the first place, he wouldn't have had anything. <laughs> so I think that's stating it, I think overstating it a bit because Chris Thomas, who was producing it eventually said, hey, he recalled going down and getting tapes, uh, sound effects with John. So it wasn't just George and Ringo, but I found it was very fascinating that they had that much input to the selection of the, the tapes that were used. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not totally convinced that it necessarily matters which sound effects they use, to be perfectly honest. I He says, you know, without that, John wouldn't have had anything. I think John would have been well capable of going to the library and the EMI library and finding them. It's not really so much the sounds Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. It's the way they're put together and the spooky atmosphere that is created. And like I say, you know, if anyone is more is interested in um, pursuing this track a bit more, I definitely recommend headphones. I definitely think it's more effective late at night or early in the morning, you know, when your senses are in a certain place. Um, I think it's, so if you take some of the very mundane, I mean, there's a, there's a sound of, uh, it sounds like drag car racing. There's a guy saying number 30. There's an announcement. There's obviously the American football fans going, block that kick. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a loop. Did you Have you heard the loop of uh, George Martin saying, Jeff, turn the red light on? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
yeah, that's weird. Jeff, turn the red light on. And it kind of drifts left and right. So I don't think it's really the sounds, although it's interesting to hear laughing, crying. You know, it's interesting to hear that. And then there's a bell at one point. They're pretty, it's pretty mundane, really. I don't mean mundane is a bad thing, but mundane in terms of everyday things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I say the only things that are really, really strange sounds is these John vocalisms, as I said. And when I did the show, I actually isolated them. And to hear them all together is quite something. Mm -hmm. uh, this screaming he's doing and all the whimpering and whatever else he's doing. So I, I don't think it matters so much what the sounds are. So I wouldn't necessarily give George... I give him credit for compiling it, fair enough, or, you know, getting them together. But I think John was the one, I think it was the only time he ever they ever utilised three studios at the same time. I'm sure that's the only time. Mm. And when I um, when I did my show, and like I said, I, I wrote something about it. It's a sort of an extension of a show because I was supposed to be writing a book last year that may still happen, may not. Um, I always think of this kind of mad pop star, rock star, commandeering all three studios and you know he was the one who was taking them taking the sounds and putting the fader up and down and so forth mm -hmm. the mad so scientist I think, yeah the mad scientist exactly it's even more if you think that um they used to wear white coats didn't they the engineers at abbey road yes they did which just seems more and more appropriate you know i think i wrote something about you know when they were considering to taking lennon off to the funny farm once and for all you know because it, it must have been an incredible night. I think it was 8 a.m. till 2 in the morning or something. Hmm. But I think it was really John, and I guess with um, either direct support or moral support of Yoko, who kind of mixed it, if you like. Yeah. But obviously George did the voices. He so did. He was involved. And George also, the reason why I found another uh, thing about uh, George Harrison, that he maybe had more a better understanding of what was needed when he did pick out those tapes. Because if you listen to the Wonderwall album, there's a song called Dream Scene. And that is very much like the predecessor to this track. It's got some music concrete in it, and it's got sound effects. That is really quite a predecessor to Revolution 9. And that was recorded, would have been either November 67th through February 68th. So he came to those sessions, I think, with a little more background. I think most of us have ever given him credit for. But, you know, again, I think he kind of removed himself from it once John and Yoko kind of, you know, let it run away with themselves. Yeah, there's a couple of quotes, aren't there? Do we know whether these are verified that John Lennon said avant-garde was French for bullshit? <laughs> and, uh, That's George, one of the famous, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, yeah, maybe true, or, maybe not. George Harrison said, I avant-garde a clue. Yeah, that one I believe he may it. have even said, he might have said that in the anthology as well. So, um, oh, well, but I, I think those are both accurate. And you know, you know how Lennon is, one of his mm -hmm. flippant remarks. But I think obviously he had, uh, he was thinking of it differently some years later. You know, he made, he wrote two books, obviously, in his own right, spanning in the works. There's a posthumous one called Skywriting by Word of Mouth. And some of it is actually fairly straight narrative of him talking about that period. Um, because they were going to do a musical called The Ballad of John and Yoko at one point. Uh, John and Yoko, not the Beatles. And um, he seemed to turn. He's one of these people who would believe in something for a long time. And then when his um, expectations or fantasies weren't realised, he'd turn on it. And then, I can say, I, I have a bit of a psychology background. This is a fairly classic character trait of certain people. They get very into something, and then when it doesn't turn out to be what they want, they... They abandon it very quickly and they make snide remarks about it in the future. Mm. So he turned on Janoff, he turned on um, Ruben and Hoffman. And I think he turned on, uh, I don't know, maybe he turned on the avant-garde as well, perhaps. Because uh, the point has been made that he was very unexperimental, really, in his solo career. After Plastic Ono Band, arguably sometime New York City is quite experimental with this idea of rock journalism but he really became a fairly straight musician from mind games onwards really mm -hmm. yeah very so true. i think he just i think he turned on it like he turned on a lot of things yeah very yeah. fickle mm. oh of course i mean that is john lennon isn't it mm -hmm. that's why we love him i suppose <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do we know anything about um john and george doing these voices do we know where they came from because I, I never found were they reading from magazines or something 
I, I don't know anything know. about that. I thought I always thought that they were just spontaneous and they just picked a couple of words that they liked and just they just added it to the mix. So yeah. I didn't think there was anything really thought through on that that I can recall. But um, Yoko's maybe on the other hand, some of that was already recorded and they just used those pieces and put those in, which are very interesting. Is that from this audio diary? No, this audio thing she was doing while they were recording. She sounds like a little girl the whole time, yeah. doesn't she? It's quite, yeah. quite, yeah, it's quite very childlike. It's quite adorable in a way. Um, she she sounds very naive, although I don't think she was a very naive person generally. I think her right. and John, they're probably a weird mixture of uh, quite childlike and naive, but quite streetwise at the same time. That must have been, it's one of the reasons they connected, I'm sure. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. But I think that, a, and I think they complimented each other too, because John, he I mean his pop background was just unmistakable, and it he always returned to it, and it was just part of him. And then obviously Yoko introduced him this whole other side that he just reveled in, at least briefly, you know, for a few years. Mm. But uh, like everything else, he kind of moves on, or reverts yeah. back to or reverts back to Bebopalula. Yeah, well, he, he'd always love that, wouldn't he? You know, if he'd lived to now, if he was eighty three, whatever he'd be now, yeah. he'd still love Bebop Lula, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, he just, he'd be into something and then he'd, then he'd turn on it for a while and then he might have gone back to it, you know, we never know. But it's interesting that, um, like I said, if you are into this uh, track, let's call it, this piece, um, some of the actual vocal stuff that him and George do, the talking, it does become quite iconic in the way that if you think of I Am The Walrus, those King Lear lines, you know, serviceable mm -hmm. villain and sit you down, mm -hmm. father, rest you, they become iconic. You know, they might be the yeah. only Shakespeare lines that some people know if they're not into Shakespeare. But, you know, there's bits like um, uh, the Watusi, the twist, El Dorado. George says, El Dorado. El Dorado. And John says, uh, take this, brother, may it serve you well, which mm -hmm. is I use at the end of Glass Onion episodes as the music's faded out, which is just fantastic. And the... Uh, he, he uses a Scouse accent, so you go like, so the wife called, or we better go to see a surgeon. Mm -hmm. It's that exaggerated Scouse that you hear on Polythene Pam, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, because I've heard it so much, those lines have become iconic. And there's actually different um, mixes of Revolution Line. There's a mono mix on uh, YouTube. It's not that different, but it's just a little bit different. And then someone has actually done a deconstructing with isolated tracks which all sound fairly similar, but one track will have maybe more voices mm. and one will have, you know, certain instrumental bits uh, louder. So there are a few variations, but uh, yeah, I just think it's really interesting. But uh, I'd like to know, yeah, where John, John and George were getting that from. I feel like they might've been reading it from somewhere. It is stuff like financial imbalance and uh, another famous line is, um, Every one of them knew that as time went by, they get a little bit older and a little bit slower, which is fair enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can't argue with that. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can't help but wonder that if Paul McCartney was actually around, what his contributions would have been. Because I think that, uh, I, did, now that did Lennon take the opportunity to do that while he was gone? Would it have, was it a just a way for him to get it out of his system? Or Because yeah. Paul McCartney, I think, probably felt a little put out that he either one, wasn't really included in it, mm -hmm. or two, feeling, um, hey, I've been, <laughs> why you get, now you're you're doing this now after I introduced you to this a couple of years ago? Yeah. And it was really Paul that set up his studio so he could mess around with tape loops. Mm -hmm. So for Lennon not to include him, it just kind of shows, I don't think he was keeping him out so much as he was just so enamored with his relationship with Yoko Ono. And like I said, that yeah. kind of ran off with itself. And then Paul McCartney comes back to find, basically, it, it, he felt like Cynthia when he she found Lennon and Ono in her bathroom. You know, I feel like McCartney yeah. was the same. It was the same thing with him. You know, but they yeah, but these, went to the studio we, instead of the bedroom. These are the conversations we're never going to hear, aren't they? You know, I think. Did you send me something where, um, yeah, he played it to them, the other members of the group when it was finished, and their you know their yeah, faces maybe, fell or something. Yeah, this is from the Jeff Emmerich book, <clears throat> Here, oh, There, Everywhere. Let me just read that quote. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, McCartney had been in the America for a while during the mm -hmm. recording of that, and then George and Ringo also for a period, which would have been June 7th to the 18th, to be exact. Mm -hmm. So when they came back, uh, this is in Jeff Emmerich's book, 
A few days later, all four Beatles were united in the studio and John proudly played the two tracks that he had completed while the rest were away. I could see from the dark cloud that came over Paul's face that he was totally underwhelmed with Revolution 9 when he first heard it, and there was an awkward silence after the track faded out. John looked at Paul expectantly, but Paul's only comment was, not bad, which I knew was a diplomatic way of saying he didn't like it. Ringo and George Harrison had nothing to say about the track. They looked distinctly embarrassed, and you could tell that neither of them wanted to get caught in the middle of this. Yeah. So you have what you have here, and... um. This scenario here is not like what happened a year later with Maxwell Silver Hammer. So you get the two extremes, McCartney on one extreme. It's almost like he was getting back, you know. But I mean, poor Ringo and George had to, you know, they just got to put up with it, you know. So it's, this is a, a Paul and John thing. And um, yeah, I mean, it's too bad that I think Paul could have added something to this, but maybe it was better this way. I don't know. I, I don't like I don't uh, like to see them fight. I don't like to see them fight. So that's the bias I bring. I would have liked to have them be all mm. harmonious, harmonious, but uh, I, it just wasn't that way. You know, I think we have to accept that there are certain conversations we're never going to know about. You know, either because people don't remember or they don't want to reveal it. But yeah, yeah when we did that nineteen sixty eight show, we talked about the the one and only twenty four hour Beatles session, and it was five in the afternoon on one day to five in the afternoon the next day which weirdly enough was about two days before John and Yoko were busted at Montague Square, which is quite weird. You just think of John Lennon, that's a weird three days for John Lennon. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we're never going to hear that conversation of, uh, you know, when they were sequencing it, because that was what most of that session was. Um, shall we include it? Shall we not? You know, did they fight? Did Paul say, yeah, all right, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I think somebody might have been, it may have been Emmerich again. Uh, that there was a a, a a big argument regarding mm. putting it in or leaving it out. Mm. And um, ultimately, we know it went in. And I think that the album is better for it. I mean, it's certainly, I mean, there's nobody, there's very few things that can compare to it in pop music. Mm. So I think that was the right decision. I mean, yeah, if they didn't put Revolution 9 in, the two tracks that would have taken its place would have been Not Guilty, but that George Harrison song, and then What's the New Mary Jane, apparently. Yeah. But those those tracks don't really add to the overall white album landscape like Revolution Nine does, so I think the compromise that was made, no matter how it got to be, was probably the right one. I mean, I could I could see a case for saying that you know fans were deprived of eight minutes of you know classic Beatles, more more mainstream music. But say, so. I, I quite like Not Guilty actually. I'm not I'm not mad mm-hmm. on What's the New Mary Jane, but um, if we think about Side Four. The last side of the white album i've, I've always found that very spooky from uh, and this is from uh, 14 years old because it was always uh white album was always the headphones album for some reason maybe i realized not only revolution nine but the whole album maybe i just realized it was better it's it, i remember it as being a kind of a late night headphones album for me hmm. and um but side four has a weird spookiness i've always loved uh you know that can you take me back can you take me back where I came from? The yeah, whole uh, yeah. Paul's voice on that is very strange. And Cry Baby Cry sounds weirdly spooky, although it probably mm-hmm. wouldn't. That's got that childlike quality because that sounds yes. a bit like a nursery rhyme. That's mm-hmm. quite interesting. And then, of course, you know, a great bit of sequencing, really, to have Revolution Night and then have Good Night and have Ringo, who's always going to be the most accessible Beatle, you know, the most everyman Beatle singing you to sleep so it's a weird you know because if you think of revolution nine as a nightmare then a, a lullaby fits well yeah it's almost like someone waking up from a nightmare and they want to get back to sleep and ringo sings them back to sleep you know Quite yes a nice and image it, really and done with <laughs> in the most over-the-top schmaltzy way you could do it which yeah. really is what makes the song i mean i don't care for that song on its own but in its mm. place on the white album it really works well in a way that it's I I never would have thought it could. Yeah, but did you hear that version of it on the White Album box set? Oh, I love with that. The voices, with the, the backing oh, vocals, yeah. Lovely, lovely. It's, a great, it's yeah. I kind of wish it would have. That would have maybe got a separate release. Mm. But, uh, yeah, really nice. That was lovely, wasn't it? But yeah, yeah just uh, it just ends lends a spooky air to it, and I suppose if, as well. It's um, it's exposing avant-garde music called correct that kind of music to people because I think everyone would have listened to it once. 
maybe, maybe there's some people who decided after two minutes they hated it and literally have never listened to it. But I think <laughs> everyone who who bought the White Album probably would have listened to it once. But yeah. I've described it in the piece I wrote as, as the, the only Beatles song with zero party value in the sense that in those days people would, you know, music was mostly to dance to and to listen to together. Obviously, people would be listening on their own, but I, don't, I think that sort of headphones culture of Sony Walkmans, that's when I was a kid, Sony yeah. Walkmans and uh, mm-hmm. iPods and stuff, people listen much more with headphones and, you know, as they're going off to sleep, you know, that's a whole different thing from in the 60s where generally it'd be people sitting around in a room, you know, either their bedroom or a party, listening to things together. So you, you can't even imagine, like, how would that work being at a party? you know, playing the White Album, <laughs> you know, and you've got Revolution 1, Honey Pie, Savoy Truffle on side four. That probably, you, got, you got this. Yeah, you have a good point. I'm sure it got played at parties and just got, mm. it just was there and people just had this like, what, you know? know. I'm sure it happened. Yeah, very strange, isn't it? Well, one of the things that I wanted to bring, John Lennon has a couple quotes of what the song meant. And let me just give a couple here because he talked about he was trying to paint a picture of a re- revolution using sound. Mm. And he said, Revolution I was an unconscious picture of what I actually think will happen when it happens, just like a drawing of a revolution. All the thing was made with loops. I had about 30 loops going, fed them into one basic track. I was getting classical tapes, going upstairs and chopping them up, making it backwards and things like that just to get the sound effects. And he says, not specifically about anything. It's all a set of sounds. Like walking down the street is a set of sounds. Capturing a moment in time. So I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, I think it's about, um, like I said, just to kind of reiterate, his internal trauma that he was going through, plus Vietnam, Martin Luther King, uh, Robert Robert Kennedy, all the race riots that were happening. I can hear all of that. Because it's interesting that you can hear... um, there's a sound halfway through it that sounds like um, a kind of sizzling or burning sound. And mm. I often think of it as burning rice paddies because I used to live in um, Southeast Asia. Mm. I lived in Thailand for a while and also Laos, and they're both near Vietnam. And I studied the, about the Vietnam War a lot. You know, when I did sociology at college, I did a whole thing about the counterculture in Vietnam. So I can hear all that. And you can hear, you know, when John Lennon's screaming, for example, you know, he's partly screaming for himself, but I think, you know, they, they could be the screams of war. You know, you hear gunfire, you hear all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. So um, I think you know, there's, I think that's what it really is to me. Having listened to it, you know, you'll think I'm a total lunatic if I tell you how many times I've listened to this. It's <laughs> got to be 30 or probably 50, to be honest. Wow. <laughs> but over, you know, not not like in a row. That's over sure. decades. But, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, one of the things that I wanted to mention and uh, kind of plays off what you just said with a, the critic Robert Criscow and John Piccarella called it an anti-masterpiece and commented that in effect for eight minutes of an album officially titled The Beatles, there were no Beatles. I thought that was a great quote. It's almost like the revolution comes and, you know, it's kind of apocalyptic. And the fact that there's no Beatles music there underlines that apocalypse, you know, it's like, wow. Yeah, um, you know, you've got little bits of beat. It's really the John George and the uh, Yoko show, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I like anti masterpiece. That's great. Yeah. Because I, I honestly think this is a masterpiece. I mean, I think it's, but like I said, because I've connected with it somehow and I've listened to it that many times that I do hear new stuff every time. But um, could I um, talk about some of the forerunners to it in terms of Beatles songs? Yeah. Why don't you? It'd be all right. Yeah, I'll just bust through these. There's only about there's about six or seven. I'll just mention them briefly. So if you go back to 66, you've got Rain and I'm Only Sleeping. It's got the backwards, obviously, the vocals, backwards guitar. And then if you think of Yellow Submarine, they've got all those voices in the background. Mm-hmm. Now, those voices, you know, they're a little bit music concrete because it's just sounds of people talking. But they married it to the music. And then again, it's this idea of having something that's commercial and then adding tape loops to it, as we said with the Paul McCartney thing. Um, obviously, Tomorrow Never Knows, and George Martin called Revolution 9 an extension of Tomorrow Never Knows. Strawberry Fields Forever fades out, and then it comes back in with that little bit at the end, that kind mm-hmm. of coda, if you like. Mm-hmm. And that's 
Strawberry Fields Forever is weirdly disturbing as well. I think John called it psychoanalysis set to music. And again, you can hear that's kind of about his childhood traumas as well. You know, that Strawberry Fields was a place where he used to play as a kid, but it also had a nightmarish quality because his childhood, in a way, was a nightmare. Mm. You know, the traumas of it and so forth. And then you've got um, even just stuff like Getting Better, you know, on Sgt. Pepper, they use the strings of the piano, they pluck the strings instead of mm -hmm. playing the keys. Mm -hmm. And then Good Morning, Good Morning is a good, uh, good example because the animal sounds at the end of it. The idea is that... Um, each animal was capable of devouring the one that came before. So you've got two things going on. You've got random sounds of animals, which is an everyday sound, you know, depending where you live, depending which animals are in your everyday life. But those are everyday sounds, but there's some thought done. And I think that was John's idea. So rather like Revolution 9, there is thought behind all this stuff. And then obviously being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, now we can hear that isolated tape of the all the cut up bits that yes. contributed to the steam organ. If yeah. you play them on their own, they don't mean anything. But then you've got that sort of tutti organ, do, 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 that melody being played on an organ at the same time as them. So you've got a bit of juxtaposition, but it makes sense because you've got a framework of something recognizable. And then the last one's just I am the walrus having the radio scan. A radio is an everyday sound as well. Mm -hmm. so no they had form and they were just gradually building up to this and then john said i'll oh, just let's go all no holds barred let's give them nothing particularly commercial a song with although i argue like i said there are hooks in it but certainly on first listening there's nothing that to hook on to because i've noticed with these music concrete you get sounds that seem to be going somewhere and then disappear so you get little snatches of um uh, often backwards, backwards piano, backwards whatever it is, but then they just sort of disappear, they drift off. And again, Revolution 9 uses a stereo very well because it lets you, things pan from left to right and then disappear and then reappear and start on the right and go to the left. It's very mm -hmm. uh, it's very weird. It's quite dis disorientating and it's quite spooky. I think spooky is the word I always come back to. With this. Yeah. Have you listened to it in 5.1 surround? No, I haven't. No, Alan Cozen talks about that, doesn't he? I nearly had Alan Cozen on Glass Onion. I said we could do the interview in 5.1 if you want. He thought that was quite <laughs> funny. I've not heard, heard it that it? way. You, no, I've not. In uh, fact, I, I actually bought a surround system, a secondhand uh, one, about five years ago with the intent to listen to this Beatle, these box sets in 5.1. And I've not set it up yet. So I'm getting to it, getting around to it. I think Revolution 9 would be one of the perfect ones. Yeah, yeah that would be very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I well, we how have come across. Yeah, we had um, some very positive reviews of the song, but we also have some negative ones. So the Jonathan Gould quote that you mentioned earlier, he calls Revolution Nine is an embarrassment and stands like a black hole at the end of the White Album, sucking up whatever energy and interest remain in the preceding ninety minutes of music. It is a track that neither invites nor rewards close attention. Wow, I think he, um, I think he, I think a lot of fans feel that way about that song actually so i think that as a critic though i thought he he was listening to it as a an am radio listener that expected you know a beatles song and didn't step outside of pop music to evaluate it because to sit to call it um it may suck out the energy he may get that right but um that, that it neither invites nor rewards close attention i think is a miss yeah, I mean, that's that's quite an ironic statement, really, because I think the only way that you would like it is after repeated listenings. Is he the guy who wrote Can't Buy Me Love? Uh, I don't remember. I think he wrote Can't Buy Me Love, The Beatles, Britain and America. Oh, did he? Yeah, he's like, we're actually, I added him on Facebook. I might unfriend him now after that. <laughs> joke, joke, joke. <laughs> no, if he, I think he wrote that book. That's a fantastic uh, Beatles biography, Can't Buy Me Love. But um, yeah, I, I just found that yeah a little bit ironic because it, it definitely invites and rewards close attention. Yeah, and Ian McDonald had something interesting to say about it as well. He was comparing this song to Luigi Nono's similar Non Kusami Amo Marx from 1969. And he mm -hmm. said that Nono's piece, he said to see how much more aesthetically and politically acute Lenin was than most of his 
the vaunted avant-garde composers at the time, Nono's piece entirely lacks the pop bread sense of texture and proportion manifest in Revolution 9. So that goes back to what you were saying earlier about the Beatles and Lennon in particular, their foundation is on pop. So that's why he was able to, I think, put this together in the way he did. And then McDonald recognizes how much more accessible it is within the whole avant-garde au revoir, I guess, of, that entered the pop, entered pop and was a, some kind of reflection on what was going on, that Lennon could recognize it easier. And I would go so much, so much farther to say that only Lennon could recognize that far more than Ono because of what Lennon had seen of the world and his travels with the Beatles. He was looking at the world in a much different way, perspective, and a broader perspective just because of his Beatle years, I think. Yeah. I mean, I love Ian McDonald. I love Revolution in the Head. Yeah, I'd go, I'd go along with that. Um, not if I said this earlier, but I was saying those forerunners that we talked about, the cage and that, I just don't find them very interesting. Uh, I mean, it's the kind of thing, um, I can't remember which show it was we were doing. We were talking about John and Yoko's, um, you know, they did a, a film called Smile, which is obviously John's face going from a non-smile to a smile, slowed down, so it takes however long. I, I think we said on the show that I was we were really happy that those ideas were out there in the world, but I don't necessarily want to watch the film. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, sometimes you get that, you know? That's kind of the problem with some of, uh, I think, what more of the Fluxus movement, which was, I think people confuse it with avant-garde. It's it's kind of a almost a hum- humorous way to go about some of these, these art hap- happenings that you had to be there. And they were of their time. And since that time has passed, they're just kind of like, Hey, man, that's been done before. I mean, they're not impressive today. And uh, like, that's, that's why I wouldn't watch them. You know, they're just of their time. They've not weathered the time well. Yeah, yeah. So what about, uh, can I ask you, do you like surrealist films in general, avant-garde films, maybe with a mainstream framework? Are you, are you quite into those? I wouldn't say I'm quite into them, but I've always appreciated. I mean, the, the the earliest thing I got into, I guess, was the Alfred Hitchcock Spellbound with the Salvador Dali dream sequence. Yeah, that was yeah, 1945. Yeah. That stuff started rearing its head, partic- more so in the 50s. Mm. But yeah, I've always been into that. But I don't think I would like to see a straight surreal film. Like mm. you said, I like pieces of it dropped in so it's maybe the more Mm. McCartney approach to it Mm. than having so much surrealism that I couldn't really grasp it that's why it took me so long to get to grasp Revolution 9 it took me another 12-15 years before I it really said something to me and another 12-15 years before I really could say hey this is an important piece of work and here's why yeah it just takes me longer to assess it and I need time to pass to assess it because I have to assess it to other things going on uh, con- in the contemporary time that it was made. Yeah, That's why the Dolly dream sequence in Hitchcock's film is so revolutionary because it was an early piece entering the mainstream. Yeah, within a mainstream uh, mm-hmm. film. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm more on, on the McCartney side as well. You know, I was brought up on, I mean, I was brought up on 80s pop music originally. Mm-hmm. Then I got into the Beatles in the late 80s and everything else went out the window for a few years. And then I was into 90s, you know, Britpop and grunge and stuff. So I don't really like commercial stuff. But with films, I think I was exposed to quite abstract films from an early age. And But I would like to ask, if John Lennon was alive, I would like, to, and he appeared on Glass Onion, which I'm sure he would have done. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to ask him, did you ever sit through Smile? You know, or he he did a film called Self Portrait. I don't know if you know that, but we'll let the listeners look that one up. Uh, shall I tell you what Self Portrait was? Do you know yeah, go one? ahead. Let's don't it's keep us his, in suspense. <laughs> his member going, his member going from flaccid to erect over a yes. period of about forty-five minutes. Yeah, I would ask John and Yoko, have you sat through those films? I know you think they're great ideas, and maybe they are great ideas in their heads, but like I say, maybe it's the ideas more than. Um, uh, the actual enjoyment of them. But if I could just mention a couple of films which are among my favourites, and this might seem a weird comparison, but if you take Apocalypse Now, which is one of my favourite films, that is a Vietnam film. That's got elements of, say, Platoon, you know, the Oliver Stone Mm -hmm. Platoon and other ones, Full Metal Jacket. 
but it's also got this very hallucinogenic uh chaotic thing which obviously came from the making of it and coppola when he was at Cannes, famously said my movie isn't about vietnam my movie is vietnam which you know sounds a bit big-headed but the idea was because the because the making of it was such a nightmare he just turned it into this completely surreal so he's he's showing you the surreal side of war rather mm. than necessarily a more straight thing which platoon was yeah. And then the other film is 2001 A Space Odyssey, which, again, I've heard people talk about that and they get angry because there's no there's no dialogue for 45 minutes. You've got long stretches of nothing happening and it makes people mad. But when you when you're into it, for whatever reason, and Kubrick's my favorite director, once it once you connect with it, suddenly all those negatives become positives. And you think, well, it's so nice to have this weird spacey film that doesn't have any dialogue for long stretches and has all this strange music. It's nice when when you've connected with it. So I think that's really what you come down to. But a lot of this music concrete, I find it very difficult to connect to because they don't they're not really giving you anything at all to hook on to. Well, I think the visual always helps, you know, sometimes um, that helps bring the sounds along, you know, it gives the sounds more more groundedness i think uh, but yeah I, I agree with you i think it's some of the, the music concrete that i've heard i just cannot get into it i mean it's i can appreciate it for what they were trying to do something different and outside of the mainstream to challenge people i think that's the point of a lot of it is to challenge people i'm not up for the challenge of all this stuff i mean i'm a busy guy i got a lot going on i mean do i want to take the time to yeah. to, to, to really go through all this and in the case of the White Album, it's just something thrown in the middle of an album. So it's probably as digestible as it's going to get. Mm. And um, yeah, I mean, I think most of us listen to it accidentally. We didn't choose mm. to listen to that. We just, well, what is this, you know? Yeah, it was put there, wasn't it? You know, <laughs> right at the end as well, which is interesting. Yeah. But um, yeah, just just to tell your your viewers, yeah, try try that experiment. And to you, play um, on YouTube. You can find the isolated drums of Revolution One, obviously the Ringo track. Play it very uh, very quietly in the background of Revolution Nine, and suddenly you kind of hear a, you suddenly has a beat. I mean, it already has a kind of a pulse because mm -hmm. there's a there's a kind of bass hum that sort of goes. There's some bass notes. And they use that very effectively. So that there are little hooks that you can go on to. And um, obviously the backwards sounds are just incredible. You know, there's a there's a heavenly choir, if you remember. Mm -hmm. There's a very intense part, and then everything goes quiet. You hear this heavenly choir backwards, which is very, very disturbing. You know, I mean, it's it's got that, I don't know. I've always liked religious music. I think we talked, wasn't on air, but we've talked about this, haven't we? Mm -hmm, I actually yeah. did my first ever gigs were actually in church. So I've always liked the echo, the echoey uh, ambience of a church. Mm -hmm. And that heavenly choir really uh, is, is quite strange and all the backward sounds. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. There's so much there. That's why Jonathan Gould, uh, although I love his book, that's a very ironic comment. Couldn't agree with that, mm -hmm. I'm afraid. Yeah. Mm. Well, the Beatles have one other avant-garde piece in the vaults, and that's Carnival of Light, which was not yeah. really a produced piece, but really was, I guess what you'd say, a, a live performance, a spontaneous live performance, which would not have the nuances of, of Revolution 9. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we're ever going to hear that. I got a feeling it may leak out at some point, mm -hmm. but um, we'll see what happens. It's probably going to be very underwhelming because it's... The, the guys weren't it just they just made it up on the spot just to in those days you could get away with that you know for happenings but um i, I my guess is it's not going to be very rewarding after we listen to it but i would like to listen to it yeah unfortunately if you build things up then the the chance to be disappointed with them is is greater unfortunately but True. i heard mark lewison talking about it he's the only person i've ever heard talk about it i don't know how many people have heard it apart from people at the time mm -hmm. um he he likened it to you know the 27 minute version of helter skelter that we haven't heard which unfortunately is a 27 minute version of the slower helter skelter that we heard on the anthology rather than the finished one so um i'd like you know i'll be happy to hear carnival light i think it'll come out 
before Paul passes on, I think he'll find a way of getting it out there. I mean, he could do it any time, really. I don't think anyone's stopping it. Well, I think there was somebody stopping him, actually. Oh, is there? Well, it was supposed to be in the track listing for Anthology 2, and it was it actually made mm. the physical track listing oh, was right. at the last moment. It was a George Harrison thing. Harrison. No, I'm saying Tony. now, though. Pardon? I'm saying now, I'm saying now though. You know, oh, now well, George is well I think, but... I think, no, I think that um, the reason it hasn't come out is because um, perhaps, and this is a guess, that Olivia is standing by George's not wanting it out back in 1995 because the perfect place to put it out would have been on the Sgt. Pepper box set and it didn't get on there. So mm-hmm. that told me something. And I was disappointed, even though it's it, it's probably going to be something like Revolution 9 where 99% of us are going to listen to it more than once. But I think it's it's a Beatle track and it's of the time and that would have been the place for it. And it's a shame that it didn't make it out. You were talking earlier about visuals. Um, I, I don't think it's on YouTube anymore, but uh, someone made a video to accompany Revolution 9. I'm oh, not really? sure if it's still online, yeah. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't perfect, but it was an interesting video, and it was just, this is a long time ago I watched it, but it was just a series of fairly random images. But I think if you could find good images and marry it to the music somehow, I mean, if I had the skills, I'd probably try it myself, but I don't well, have know, any of those filmic skills. But I, I think you could really heighten it quite a bit. Well, I'm yeah. thinking back to that time I was napping on the couch and I, I woke up to the sounds of Revolution 9 and that was the first mm. time it really hit me. I didn't need a visual. I guess my head was creating them. I think that's what mm. makes the track good is that it conjures up some automatic visuals and some of these other music concrete songs do not. And that's why I don't, I'm not that interested in them. So that's kind of how I uh, differentiate, uh, I guess, what is meaningful to me uh, is the visuals they create without having the physical visual in front of you. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. I'm just thinking of the, um, the sort of video they made for day in the life. Don't know if Mm. they made that at the time, you know, that was the orchestral, the session yeah. for the orchestral um, mm-hmm. overdubs, but they had some quite random. There was like, an, I remember a, a, an image of a clock at one point, just stuff like that. I feel like I'd like to see someone try it. I'm not saying it needs an official release, mm-hmm. but I, I think, you know, maybe a filmmaker who's got a surrealistic edge, likes all the abstract and really likes Revolution 9. I think they could do something with that. But yeah, yeah. I agree. You know, you can get the visuals yourself, but as you said earlier, sometimes the visuals do help you along, you know. In the right hands, mm, correct. You know, yeah, there you go. Some homework for you. you you've got <laughs> the you've got the editing skills that I haven't got. So, <laughs> oh, I put on yeah. a very long list of uh, projects yeah. for the channel yeah. here. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I think that's a good place to probably end the conversation here, and I hope uh, hopefully we'll inspire some people to give the track another listen or two. And or at least just approach it with a little bit of a different perspective. And for those of you who want a little bit more information on Revolution 9, Anthony's done a full podcast on it, episode 25 on Glass Onion, a uh, podcast on John Lennon. I'll put the links below. And I'm sure, Anthony, we will have you back for some more spotlight pieces here. But this was very, very good, very uh, satisfying to delve into this particular track. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, I do do like talking about it. And um, hopefully some of my enthusiasm for it will have rubbed off on the viewers because it's it's definitely worth a listen. There's so much there. And uh, I think, you know, it, it wouldn't spoil the surprise for, for people to try to seek out what those sounds are. You know, some of them are very recognisable, laughing, crying, car mm. horns, etc. But uh, some of them have been identified. And again, I credit uh, Alan Cozen. He was on another Beatles podcast many years ago talking about some of the sounds. You've got um, a piece by Ralph Vaughan Williams, who's an English composer. You've got some Schumann. You've got Sibelius, who was uh, Brian Epstein's famous, favourite composer. And, um, yeah, there's a few isolated tracks uh, here and there. So, yeah, there really is plenty there. So, Anthony, tell me some of uh, the things you've got going in addition to the Glass Onion. Yeah, so we've got Glass Onion on John Lennon is available everywhere. Uh, I've also got Life and Life Only, which is more psychology and alternative media, and Film Gold, which is obviously about films. You've been on, we did uh, Rear Window. So I sort of lean towards uh, older films. Haven't mm-hmm. done any abstract uh, avant-garde films yet, but you never know. But uh, 
if I could quote John Lennon, which uh, unfortunately came from the very uh, last day of his life, the famous interview with RKO, he said, uh, I always consider my work to be one piece. And my three podcasts definitely do overlap. So um, John Lennon gets mentioned on the other ones and uh, vice versa. So, yeah, I'm uh, everywhere you can. And I've got a website, Anthony Rotuno, Anthony without an H, Rotuno.com. It's also got my music and my blog. Thanks very much. Uh, always nice to come on here. Thank mm-hmm. you.